Another name came off the board on Tuesday in North Carolina's search for a center, but the good news, they might be one step closer to landing their sharpshooter. You are Locked on Tar Heels, your daily podcast on the UNC Tar Heels. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, what's up? It's Wednesday, April 17th, 2024. Welcome into the Locked On Tar Heels Podcast, the only daily North Carolina show out there. I'm your host, Isaac Shade, and you've joined us at The Place to get your team every day. Thanks for making us your first listen or watch. Special shout out to all you everydayers out there, as well as all the members of the Locked On Tar Heels Discord community. This episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code LOCKEDONCOLLEGE for $20 off your first purchase. Coming up on the show today, I need to let you know first that we actually have a second show today on Wednesday. Denora Searcy, who's been starting to come on with us more regularly, uh, joined me and we kind of talked about Carolina's football practice that everyone got a, a look at on Saturday. Um, what he saw, what he liked, where Carolina needs to keep growing, all of that stuff. But on this episode, we're sticking to basketball today. Uh, Carolina might be narrowing down the big man search. Some of that might be by default. Got some more intel on Cade Tyson and kind of building on some of what we talked about yesterday. A primer on Rutgers transfer Cliff Omori. And if Cade Tyson doesn't come to Carolina, where might Hubert Davis turn? We're going to talk about all of that on today's show. <clears throat> but let's start at, at kind of the search, both for a small forward, a three, a sharpshooter, but first for a big man in the paint, a big bruiser. So there's kind of six names that are, are the key names right now. There might be more that fluctuate in and out, as we talked about on yesterday's show, these transfer portal era relationships It's like, if you've ever seen Fight Club, remember at the beginning, he's talking about like those single serving relationships. It's like that kind of thing in and out of your life before you blink. So here are the guys that are out. We already knew that Maxime Raynaud from Stanford pulled his name out of the portal, went back to Stanford. We learned on Monday that Aaron Bradshaw, the Kentucky transfer, is transferring to Ohio State. And on Tuesday, we got more news. Another one of the more bruising bigs is also now off the board. That is Umar Balo that was transferring from Arizona. Uh, Big 10 making some splashes here in the portal. It wasn't just Ohio State landing a big. It is now Indiana who landed Umar Balo's commitment. Now, I I do have to say, over the past day or two, remember, again, these things are happening quick. Over the past day or two, whether it was on Balo's side of things or the Carolina side of things, you stopped hearing much about it. And in the transfer portal time period, that's when you start to think something's changing here. You want to continue to hear those conversations ongoing. And it was kind of wild with Balo because there was noise for him to Indiana. But then at another point, like mid-morning Tuesday, he said he was going to schedule a visit to Arkansas, but then ultimately says, no, I'm out on that, going to Indiana. So anyway, that's where he is. Jeff Goodman reported that he had like a $1.2 million asking price in NIL stuff sourced from multiple coaches that Goodman had talked to. So that's wild, and I'm fine not spending that because it's like, yeah, I you know would love to have him, but there are guys that probably cost less who I feel just as good about, right? So spend your money elsewhere. But what this does is leaves right now three key names on the board for North Carolina. One of them we talked about in depth yesterday. That was Jonas Adu, the Tennessee transfer. There's also Danny Wolf. The Yale transfer, whom we've not talked about in depth, we might do that in a show later this week or next week, if if that's still ongoing. Um, He's more of the the stretch big kind of guy, whereas Adu is more of a a bulking in the paint bruiser. And the third name on this list is in that Adu mold, and that is, is a name we've talked about, Cliff Omori from Rutgers. 
And so uh, Amori is somebody we're going to, we're going to look at actually more in depth here in just a few minutes in segment two, but um, one, and the reason I want to look at him in depth today is because on Tuesday, he released a top 12 of like basically who he will pick from and Carolina is included in that list. And so it makes a ton of sense then to go ahead with that and start looking at him as a real legitimate option. I think for a while, I and, and probably a lot of others thought it was basically a done deal to St. John's. He, um, although he's from Africa, came to America for high school, went to Roselle Catholic, which is in New Jersey, where Simeon Wilcher went, if you remember him. <laughs> if you remember him, that's funny. Um, and so the the kind of thought was he might stick around there, but it seemed like a couple weeks ago it was a done deal to St. John's, and, and it hasn't been. So... Anyway, I think it's worth us putting some eggs in that basket and truly and honestly looking at it. So when it comes down to things, I would obviously take Danny Wolf if that's who it comes down to. But to me, this feels like a race to commit between Jonas Adu from Tennessee, who we, again, we talked about yesterday, and Cliff Omori from Rutgers. I, if it If it's down to those three guys... I ultimately believe it would be one of those two, just simply because you don't have their bulk on the roster because both Baycott and Oconquo were gone, but you do have more of what Danny Wolf brings in the form of Jalen Washington. So don't double up there. Get yourself more of a hefty guy. And I must say, of Adu or Omori, there's things I like about each one. There's things that you can pick warts on anybody. Um, but I would legitimately take either, and I think they would both bring really good things to Carolina. They would both add a lot. They would both complement Jalen Washington well in terms of you know minutes shared in the post. I think they would both benefit from an Elliott Cadeau and what he could do for their game. So a, a lot to look at there. And so that that's where we sit today as of Wednesday, right? Like either looking at um, Adu or Amori. So we'll, we'll talk more about Amori here in just a little bit, but while we're kind of looking at where things stand right now, big picture stuff, I also want to come back to the Cade Tyson conversation. We'll talk about him more in segment three, because there's another conversation I want to have about Cade Tyson, but right now this is more of a, uh, where are we at update. So as we talked about yesterday, kind of the things right now are he went to Tennessee on a visit, Last weekend, he's going to Ch Chapel Hill, excuse me, this upcoming weekend on a visit. And as of now, those are the only two visits we know about. So um, a couple interesting things here. Tennessee, I believe this was on Tuesday that this happened. It might have been Monday. Picked up a portal commitment from Darlin Stone Dubar, whom I must admit, despite the fact that I cover college basketball, I was unaware of until I read his name, and it's got to be one of the best names in all of college basketball. He played one year at Iowa State, three years at Hofstra. He is, hear this, a 6'6 guard that shoots really well from outside. It's very similar to what Cade Tyson brings to the table. So I don't want to read too much into that because you can never have enough uh, big wings, never have enough shooting. But if I'm reading some tea leaves there, you've already got the guy that you want basically in that same role that Cade Tyson would play. If I'm Cade Tyson, I don't know that I want to follow Darlin Stone Dubar to Tennessee. That's just me. Now, I, I don't know what Rick Barnes has told him. I don't know what Rick Barnes has talked about from a lineup standpoint and all that, but there we have that. So let's put that in one bucket and say, Tennessee already landed a commitment from a Cade Tyson type player who, by the way, I would say is not as good as Cade Tyson. Also, here's the other thing. Remember on yesterday's show, if you were with us, I talked about this, this rumor that after Cade Tyson's visit to Knoxville, the Carolina coaching staff went and met, excuse me, met with him over dinner back in Nashville, where Belmont is, where he's played his whole, uh, his whole career so far, his first two years. Well, I was able through a source to confirm to, to confirm that that Nashville dinner did indeed happen uh, between Carolina's staff and Cade Tyson after the Tennessee visit. And then there's still the, the movement towards Tyson coming to Chapel Hill this weekend. Now, I don't want to read too much into all of that, 
But let's start adding these pieces together. Tennessee just landed a very similar style player to Cade Tyson. The Carolina coaching staff went and met with Cade Tyson after his meeting, his, his weekend at Tennessee. If he had gone to Tennessee and things had been knocked down, drag out, I don't even want to look at anywhere else, you don't meet with the Carolina coaching staff. But he did. So as I look ahead to this weekend, and I, I add up all those pieces, let's just say it could be a very good weekend in my estimation. I don't know anything. I don't know where his head's at. But again, I'm just reading tea leaves, and I've had to learn to le- read the tea leaves throughout my career in sports media. So let's just leave that where it is. So I think I, where things stand today, I'm great with either a do, a do, or a Mori in the front court. And I would, I think Carolina is in a really good spot with Cade Tyson. Would love, love, love to land that. Now, Cliff Omori, who is he? And what would he bring to Carolina? How would he benefit the team? Uh, we're going to talk about that in just a second. Right after I tell you about Monopoly Go. Now, look, I've been told that I am a competitive person. And I mean, this is like board games, uh, playing checkers with my son, whatever it is. Let's be honest, though. It's true. I am. I have a competitive side. You do. I do. We all do. And my competitive side is a big fan of Monopoly Go. I'm sure you've heard of it. It's been downloaded over 150 million times. It's a great twist on your just everyday Monopoly, where you play here on not one, but on hundreds of Monopoly boards in crazy locations, you build up these amazing cities that you bring, uh, you get to bring big money from. And the best part is then you go and mess with your friends. I can charge them rent on my iconic properties, just in like the regular old Monopoly game, the classic. But now I can also rob their vaults of riches for myself. And the leaderboards show me who the biggest Monopoly tycoon is. But it's not just my competitive side that loves it. You can team up with friends and people all around the world in timed tournaments to earn huge rewards. So get in the game and join your friends. Download Monopoly Go now, free on the App Store or Google Play Store. We talked yesterday specifically about Jonas Adu from Tennessee, the transfer. If you haven't watched that, you should go check it out. It's great. Or if you haven't listened to it, you should go listen to it. It's great. Today, we're going to talk about the other big man that we're looking at very seriously right now for North Carolina, and that is Rutgers transfer, Cliff Omori. Omori is a big dude, just like Armando Baycott, very similarly sized, 6'11", 240. He's from Nigeria, uh, but as I said earlier, he came to play basketball at Roselle Catholic in New Jersey, same place as Simeon Wilcher, where he went last year. So makes a lot of sense that he's been at Rutgers. He's played four years of college basketball, just like RJ Davis. But that means that he has one year of COVID eligibility available to him and he wants to use it. North Carolina would be a great place for him to do so. Two years ago, Omori was second team, all big 10 and all big 10 defensive team. This most recent year that just finished was honorable mention all Big Ten, but once again, found himself on the Big Ten all defensive team. Are you noticing a trend there? Uh, you should be because I'm making, I'm laying it on thick, folks. Last year, here are his number averages. 10.4 points a game, 8.3 rebounds, 2.9 blocks a game. I'm a big old fat fan of that. Uh, one thing I'm not a big fan of, just 61% at the free throw line, but did shoot 51.2% from the field. Um, the year before that, his junior year, almost averaged a double-double in Armando Baycott territory, territory 13.2 points a game, 9.6 rebounds a game, and 2.1 blocks. So each of the past two years, he's averaged double-digit points, just shy of double-digit rebounds, and in, in the two blocks per game range. I will take that. In fact, last two years ago, when he was so close to averaging a double-double, he led Rutgers in points, in scoring, rebounding, and blocks. That's unique. I love that. Um, a couple things, uh, you know, he, he's the kind of guy that has taken threes in his career, but he's a guy that lives in the paint, basically. That's where you want him to be and to stay and to live. Last year shot, shot 62% at the rim and 67% of his field goal attempts came from there. That's where he needs to be. 
just in less than three second increments at a time because you don't want to get whistled, but whoever whistles that. A couple other strengths I want to mention. You know, obviously we just talked about the blocks per game. Well, let's put it in percentages. He has a 12.7% block rate. That is absurd. And the highest of any of these guys we've talked about in recent days, whether it was a Duthiero, who, you know, is smaller and would play a small ball four, um, but a, a higher block rate than Adu brings to the table as well. In fact, he has 221 career blocks. Contextualize that for me, Isaac? Sure, I'd be happy to. If though if he had played for Carolina for four years, that would put him fourth on the all-time Carolina blocks list. Behind only three guys, whose names are Brendan Haywood, John Henson, and Sam Perkins. Maybe you've heard of him. It would be, he would, right now, is ahead of what Armando Bacot did in five years. So, yeah. Elite shot blocker. We'll take it. Offensive rebounding percentage, 9.4%. That's a little bit under where Jonas Adu is, if I remember that stat correctly. Um, but still, just shy of 10% offensive rebounding rate. Yeah, we'll take that too. Another thing that's interesting to me, as the the roller or the pop guy in, in screen and roll or pick and pop kind of action, has 1.31 points per possession. That puts him in the 85th percentile in the nation. And so that that's something that you think about, like, in let's say you're on the floor with both Elliot Cadeau and RJ Davis. Obviously, we don't know for sure what's going on there, but let's just imagine that world. And and he's got that capability in pick and roll game or pick and pop game. Come on. Yeah, I want every bit of that. Um, but what's neat about Omori is he is a difference maker. Truly, on both ends of the floor, but it primarily shines on the defensive end. But I think part of the reason we don't right now say that about his uh, ability on the offensive end of the court is apologies to Steve Peichel, the head coach at Rutgers. He's been playing at Rutgers, whose offense is just not good. It's a shambles. So you bring him to Carolina. There's a lot more there. Um, now, Omori, again, is not somebody you look at as a stretch five. You don't want him getting out and shooting. He would not be what Danny Wolf or Jalen Washington bring to the table. You want him for his uh, rim protection, for his rebounding, for his go up and get this lob and just dunk it kind of game. And that, by the way, is my favorite thing about what he does. He ju Omori just dunks everything you throw at him. Two seasons ago, as a junior going into the AC NCAA tournament, excuse me, he led the nation in dunks at that point. Um, it's just bringing everything to the table. And so, by the way, when you think about that, he was doing that with Rutgers guards. He was not doing that with Elliot Cadeau, who was one of the best passers in the entire nation. So if I'm, if I'm Cliff Omori and I look at this and I'm like, Oh, so my guards could be Elliot Cadeau and RJ Davis. I, so where do I sign, right? Like that makes a ton of sense to me. A strong point guard is going to be phenomenal for unlocking some of what Omori brings to the table offensively. One thing I, I would like to see his um, field goal percentage come back up was just 51.8% from the field this year. But Heading into last year, he was 54.9% from the field for his career. That would have been fourth. That was fourth all time at Rutgers. So I, I almost look at what happened this year as something of an anomaly. And again, when you have better offensive players playing around you, like he would at Carolina, you got to think that number, that percentage goes up, right? So, because it's not just good enough to look at what his numbers have been. You got to try to project what would he be with this roster around him. It's kind of like you look at what Harrison Ingram had to try to do basically on his own at Stanford. It's a whole different ball game in Chapel Hill. You look at Cormac, same thing. You get it. You're with me. Okay. Now, uh, for a long time, as I said earlier, it has felt like St. John's is the clear leader to Lando Mori. But that that has, I don't know if it's stalled. There was like a scheduling conflict, but I'm always reading into that as like, okay, well, why didn't you make it work, right? So uh, while Carolina is part of a tough group of Final 12, I mean, some of the other schools, UCLA, K-State, Georgia Tech, Georgetown, Baylor, Alabama, Oregon, Washington, Georgia, Mississippi State, like there's some great, like he just looks like a Baylor big to me, right? When you look at it, um, Alabama, Nick Pringle entered the transfer portal on Tuesday night. 
Omori could fit in really well there. So there's tough competition that Carolina's got to go up against, clearly. But Armando Baycott's gone. Basically, nobody that does what you do is on the roster. There's so much availability to you in Chapel Hill. Now, something else to keep in mind. We talked about Umar Balo's asking price in NIL. No, thank you. Here's the thing you need to remember with Omori. He is an international player, meaning he cannot bend. Like people are working to find ways to, to allow international student athletes to benefit from NIL, but it's just not free range like it is for American students. And so that's less of a consideration with Omori than it would be even with Jonas Adu. So there's something to keep in mind there too. Um, and going back to the defense, let me say this. Despite losing Trimble, getting Cliff Omori allows you to work at keeping the same elite defensive identity that Carolina had last year, which is funny when you think about Carolina. Again, you always think offense. But clearly, Coach Davis had this team bought into the defensive end, and, and they just let it ride. And he could continue to do that legitimately. He is one of the best, if not the best, defensive bigs in the entire nation, especially now that Donovan Klingon's off to the NBA. And on the offensive side, let me just say again, Rutgers is not a good offensive team. Coming to Carolina is going to unlock that. What could Omori be in a new and better and more up-tempo, by the way, offense? The more I talk about it, the more I like what I see with Cliff Omori. So again, I think Adu would be a great fit too, though. They, they both bring a lot to the table and I feel very confident and comfortable with either of these guys being who Carolina lands. Now, Carolina seems to be in a good position with Cade Tyson, but it's hard to know what will ultimately happen because again, it's the transfer portal and this is what goes on. If the Tar Heels don't land Cade Tyson, what do you do? Because you need a sharpshooter. Where will Hubert Davis turn? I've got a suggestion. And I'll share that with you right after I tell you about Yahoo Finance. Hey, wouldn't it be great if you could see all of your investment and retirement accounts all in one place? Well, with Yahoo Finance, you can consolidate your views from multiple accounts into one hub and access the expert analysis you need to tend to your entire portfolio with confidence in a one-stop shopping sort of way. I used to try and do this all on my own with like an Excel spreadsheet, which I love working with Excel spreadsheets. You know me, I'm a stats guy. I love it. But my own self-made spreadsheets just didn't hold a candle to trying to use something much better. It was so much time, so much trouble. And so a friend of mine who knew that I did all that recommended that I switch to using today's sponsor, Yahoo Finance. And I'm deadly serious when I say this. I have never turned back. For more than 25 years, Yahoo Finance has been the brand behind every great investor. So whether you're a seasoned investor or you're like me and you're just pouring a little bit extra on top of your 401k in every month and doing things like that, man, Yahoo Finance is the thing for you. 401k, other investments, whatever it is, a comprehensive perspective is what sets apart great investors. And it's how Yahoo Finance ensures you have the insight to look at your wealth in its entirety. For comprehensive financial news and analysis, visit the brand behind every great investor, yahoofinance.com, the number one financial destination, yahoofinance.com. One more time, yahoofinance.com. I said on Tuesday's show that shooting is the most important and sought after commodity in basketball. You're going to just hear me say this over and over and over again. And it's so helpful that we have a great example from North Carolina in the form of Cam Johnson, who, because he is such a stinking good shooter, rose all the way up into the lottery and got that uh, memeable memory uh, of that, that Kobe White did when he heard about Cam getting drafted. That's how important shooting is in basketball, not just the NBA, but in the college game as well. So, my question is this, if Carolina is unable to land Cade Tyson, where do you turn? What do you do? Where do you go? Because to me, he is just so stinking desirable and good. I'm just going to keep hammering that home. Well, the person I would turn to the second on my list at that critical spot is Dayton transfer Kobe Brea. Now it's interesting. I haven't brought him up yet because he just hopped in the portal 
later on Monday evening. And so Tuesday, spent some time looking at him and his game and numbers and stats and everything he does. I remember him uh, from watching Dayton this season and, and some of his postseason stuff as well. To me, Brea has just become the second most important target to me for the Tar Heels behind Cade Tyson and ahead of those bigs. Because it is, to me, so incredibly critical to have a sharpshooter on your roster. And that's what Brea is in a very similar way to Cade Tyson. Now, he's played four years at Dayton, so has one more year of eligibility. So um, there, there's that. You just get him for one year. Um, and another thing we need to just say is this is not me saying this is a guy Carolina has contacted. To our knowledge at this point, he is not. In fact, on it was either on Monday or Tuesday, a list came out. I think it was on Tuesday of schools that had contacted him since he entered the It must have been Tuesday because he entered the portal Monday night and the list came out on Tuesday. The Tar Heels are not on that list. Now, you could read into that and say they don't need to because they got Kate Tyson. Sure, maybe we read into that with all those tea leaves we were looking at earlier. But, uh, you know, if Carolina strikes out on Tyson, they're probably going to want to get in on Brea. He is a 6'6 wing. Last year scored 11.1 points per game for Dayton. And listen to this. This is what is so mind-boggling to me. 49.8% from three-point range. And it's not like, oh my word, that's wild. And he did that because 11 attempts. No, 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 no. He shot that ridiculous three-point average on 201 attempts. That's 6.1 attempts a game. That is absolutely bonkers shooting. Like if he had made, literally, he made 100 of his 201 attempts. If he had made one more three last year, he would have shot over 50% on 201 three-point attempts. That's insanity to me. He also is a really good free throw shooter, although he doesn't get there much. But when he does, he's money. This this year, 14 of 16 the year before, 7 of 7. But again, he doesn't get there much. And here's why. Part of that is beyond being a sharpshooter, there's not really much else that uh, Brea adds. 3.8 rebounds last year, 1.2 assists, and was under one combined in stocks, which is steals and blocks thrown together. Uh, you, you throw that together and you're still under one with the combination. So there, there is that. Um, but something I love about him, You know where he's from? New York. You know who loves New York guards? A guy named Hubert Davis. You know who Hubert Davis is? The guy ultimately responsible for deciding who he wants to try to get on his team. So so that's a thing. Washington Heights, just one of the uh, neighborhoods there of of Manhattan. And so you look at that and it's like, hey, Washington Heights, New York. Let's do it. Let's make it happen, right? Um, And so, um, but... One concern I do have as I look at what Brea brings. All those 201 three-point attempts last year, he had less than a quarter of the same amount of two-point attempts. Just 45 two-pointers attempted all season long last year. Had 47 the year before, 85 two years ago. So he had more there, but um, and he shot a good percentage on those twos, 57.8% but it's just not many attempts. Also, he's not as big as Cade Tyson. Now, he's still bigger than Cormac Ryan, but Cade Tyson does have more size and length than Brea. So I, I start to look at this and I say, I really like what Brea brings. And I think there's a world in which some might say he's the better shooter. But I think Cade Tyson's the all-around better basketball player. And it's very close on the shooting. Because here's where I'm at. Tyson is bigger. He has more eligibility. That's a two-year potential rather than a one-year with Brea. As opposed to Brea's 45 two-point attempts last year, Cade Tyson had 185. And he made 96 of those. So he made more than double the number of twos that Brea attempted. But when you look at threes, he only shot 29 fewer threes and only made 20 fewer. So he nearly matched what Brea did from three, 
but shot insanely more and made insanely more twos than Brea did. He brings more outside of just shooting threes, had more scoring last year, 16.2 points a game, more rebounding, 5.9 more assists, 1.6. So while I love Bray a lot, and I think Bray a lot, excuse me, and I think he is a good second option behind Tyson. And it, the other thing is, while he shot well in other seasons, he's never shot this well in other seasons. So is it replicable to basically shoot 50% from three again next year? Law of averages says no. Cade Tyson, on the other hand, has continued to do this year after year after year. So Cade Tyson, that is still my number one target over everyone else in the transfer portal. But Kobe Brea would be a very nice consolation prize to take as just a marksman to draw the defense away from whoever that is inside. There you go. All right, gang, it's been great to be together today on tomorrow's show. We'll have Coach Rob joining us. Always look forward to that. Can't wait to have him. And then on Friday, we'll have Coach Pat Kilby as well. Two great shows to be able to wrap up the week. Obviously, when news, if and when news breaks later this week, if there is any, we'll bring it to you. If not, we'll just keep on trucking till we finally hear something. If you're not part of the Lockdown Tar Heels Discord community, we'd love to have you come join. It's free and the link is in the show notes. Just click right in there and grab it. If you haven't subscribed to the show on audio or video, do that as well. No excuse not to. If you're a listener, do it. Any podcast platform, just hit subscribe. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that little subscribe button right down there at the bottom. Cost you nothing. Literally takes two seconds and it really helps us out as a show and means a ton. Gang, it's always a great day to be a Tar Heel. We'll be back again tomorrow, but until then, peace.